that we oftentimes do not understand or recognize because of our humanness. And I think because of our humanness, we tend to have what I call a limited view of God. But I think as you look through the Bible, you see how people react to God. And if you've ever noticed, there are a lot of folks who have biblical names. Sarah, Rachel, David, Paul are all very common names and have been forever because they're in the Bible. But you will find a few names that you rarely, if ever, see. Jezebel, while I do know there's a few that have been named Jezebel, it's very few. And for good reason, if you study Jezebel in the Bible, you see she's not a nice gal. But the guy we're going to study today is a guy named Nimrod. And I just have never met anyone named Nimrod. And it might have something to do with the fact that his name has become synonymous with a fool or idiot. And maybe we ought to look and see why that is. My first scripture today is Genesis 10, 8 through 12. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And therefore it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Palak, and the land of Shinar. And that land he went to into Syria. And he built Nineveh, Rebeth, Ur, Kea, and Rezin, between Nineveh and Kea. That is this great city. Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. He was the son of Ham, or the great, his grandfather was the uh, Ham, and he bore Cush. And if you remember from Noah's time, Ham was one of the cursed because of what he had done with his father. There's not a whole lot of scriptures about Nimrod in the Bible. But if you get into Jewish text, you will find a great deal about Nimrod. And this is how we find out so much. And a guy named Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, writes this about Nimrod. And I think it's interesting to note, even though it's about biblical, and so I didn't put it on your scripture list, but I think it is effective to tell us who Nimrod was from Jewish tradition and what it was about Nimrod that upset God. And Josephus writes, Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such a front and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God, as it were, though he means that they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way to turning men from the fear of God, but to bringing them into constant dependence on his power. Looks a lot like a lot of the governments I see today. He also said he would be revenged on God if it should be in his mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach. And he would avenge himself on God for destroying his, their forefathers. Now the multitudes were very ready to follow him in the determination of Nimrod and to esteem it as a piece of cowardice to submit to God. They built a tower, neither sparing any pains nor being of any degree of negligence about the work. And by reason of multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high sooner than any other could expect. But the thickness of it was so great that it was strongly built, that thereby it became a great height seemed upon the view to be less than it really was. It was built of burnt brick, cemented together with mortar, made of bidium, that is not liable to have water. And when God saw that they acted so madly, he did not resolve to destroy them utterly, since they were not grown wiser by the destruction of the former sinners. But he caused a tumult among them, by producing among them a diverse language, and causing that, through the multitude of these languages, they should not be able to understand one another. The place wherein the tower was now called is Babylon, because it was confused the language, and it was readily understood before, for the Hebrews mean by this word, Babel, confusion. Nimrod has rejected God. 
according to Josephus, he not only has contempt for God, he desires to take as many people away from God as possible, and he challenges God. You will never destroy this world again because I'm going to build a tower too tall for you to flood. Now the irony is, Nimrod didn't study his Bible. Noah was possibly still alive at the time of Nimrod. Certainly, Cush was certainly still alive. And Ham and those. And they would have told him. God had promised to never flood the ground again. But Nimrod, not being a man of God, wasn't suffice with that promise. He didn't trust God and he did not like God. And therefore he tried to take everyone away from God. I find it interesting to see Josephus says that he was the first of the tyranny. He used tyranny to scare and hold his subjects into place. By the way, a tactic that still works quite well today. If you look at how many tyrannical governments are around this world and have been in the time. I find it interesting that he sought to build a tower not only for his own glory, but to defy God. And it's interesting because that seems to be man's ambition when he wants to fight God. I will make myself equal to him. It is the sin that Satan had when Satan told God, I believe I'm equal to you and I deserve your throne just as much as you do. This pride goes before a fall. You've heard that one before. And with Nimrod, that certainly was the case. But he certainly was not the last. It might surprise you that the Tower of Babel, we can pretty much put a location on it, although we don't know the exact. There are people who believe they did. The last one who knew where he thought was the most exact place of the Tower of Babel was a man you are familiar with. His name was Saddam Hussein. And while Saddam Hussein was the leader of Iraq, he set out to rebuild the Tower of Babel, just like Nimrod. Now, I find that kind of normal because as we see what happened to Saddam Hussein, he kind of had the same end as Nimrod did. It didn't go so well. But the type of attitude that says, I will defy God, seems to have just thrived in the times between Nimrod and Saddam Hussein. When it comes down to looking at man's rejection of God, we have to be very careful because quite frankly, the Nimrods among us will try to lead us away from God. And God will try to protect us, but he can only do so much. Genesis 11 talks about the Tower of Babel being destroyed and the people's language being scrambled. 11 verses 6 through 9, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have a one language, and there is only the beginning of what they will do. Which, boy, did he have that right. And nothing these people propose to do will not be impossible to them. Come, let us go down, and therefore confuse their language, so they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed from there the face of the earth, and they left, the build, left off the building of the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. Now, there are folks who will tell you that when they read that scripture, that God was afraid of what man could do that they might accomplish something like the Tower of Babel and it actually will do what it wants to do. This is kind of ludicrous because we know enough about science today to know that there is no such thing as a man-built tower that could ever reach high enough to heaven. But it doesn't stop man from trying. And the sin was not so much the tower, it was the attitude behind the tower. It was the absolute rejection of God and the absolute conflicting with God. I will not accept your will. I will not accept your goal in my life. Nimrod was not about to let God have any control in his life. 
And like I said, that grandiose delusion carries on through this time. And unfortunately, it has become extremely popular with people today. God is told by many people today, I reject you, I do not acknowledge you, I will not accept your will, I will not accept your ways, because I am my own sovereign. I will call my own shots. I get to decide what is right and wrong for me. That is the attitude of Nimrod. It is the attitude of Satan. It is, in fact, what will cause man to fall. What Josephus was saying about Nimrod was it was not content alone to just defy God. He wanted to take as many people with him as possible. He wanted to inspire people to reject God. And I'm telling you what, if you listen today, even in many churches, the number of people who are trying to get people to turn away from God and look at something else, it's amazing how many there are. And that, rather than the tower, is what God would not stand for. That is why God literally scrambled the languages. And I want to stop right here because what is happening and what you see today is many of the prejudices and the racial conflicts that we have are based on language. They talk different than we do, and therefore we don't like them. We don't understand them. I remember being with people when the immigration started in this area. Most of you are kind of the same age I am, and so you remember when there were very few immigrants in this town. And now you look around and you go, there's very few non-immigrants in this town. In fact, many of the businesses are immigrant run. And one of the things that I heard was I don't like them because when we're at the mall together and they're talking, I don't know if they're talking about me. And it's like a little insecurity thing. Well, you know, and I'm thinking how wonderful it must be to be you when you think that everyone around you is talking about you. You know, they don't even know you exist. But you're worried that they might be talking about you. And of course, I always like to feed that by going, well, they were. Yeah, and they were saying, look at that fool. He can't understand a word we're saying. And I would just feed into that, and they'd just like, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. And then I'd laugh at them and say, you have no idea. The truth of it is, language has certainly led to the problems that we face and there are people who will say, see, God created prejudice. My friends, nothing could be less true. Nothing could be further from the truth. God did not create prejudice. Cain killed his brother Abel when they spoke the same language, worshipped the same God. He had prejudice against his brother because his brother was righteous and he was not. Prejudice is part of man's heart that is evil. God neither developed it, desired it, nor produced it by this scattering of the languages. The scattering of the language just seemed to work well for the prejudices that were already there. So God did not create prejudice. That was coming from man himself. Evil will never originate from God, and it will never be his will. Evil is the result of man's rebellion against God. Nimrod was an evil, tyrannical ruler. They called him a mighty man. A better way of saying it was a ferocious man. One who you feared, because he was a man that was driven. And if you opposed him, you could expect harsh treatment. That was not God's way. It certainly was not God's will. And I will tell you this. 
when we look at man's evil and we try to attribute it to God, there's a part of us that wants to take responsibility away from ourselves and place it in God's hands. When we tell people that God is the reason why there's evil in this world, my friends, you did not read your Bible. The Garden of Eden had no evil in it until two human beings willingly chose to reject what God told them and willingly opposed God by doing what he told them not to do. That is how evil came into this world. That is how evil maintains in this world. It is never God's will. It is never God's desire. But because we are sinful people, we are in fact going to have to face. My next scripture is Deuteronomy 28, verses 45 through 51. All these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God and keep the commandments and his statutes as he commanded you. They shall be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness, gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and lacking everything. He will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar and from the ends of the earth swooping down like an eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. It shall eat the offspring of your cattle and of your fruit of your ground until you are destroyed. It shall also not leave you grain, wine, or oil and the fruit of your ground and increase of your herds, your young flocks, until they have caused you to perish. There are people who avoid the Old Testament because of verses like that. They want a loving God who forgives everything and kind of is like that old grandfather that goes, Aw, shucks, you ornery little kid. I got to love you anyway. The truth of the matter is, the God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. Those who tell you that God changed from the Old to the New have not read either one of those Testaments. There is no difference between the God of Deuteronomy and the God of John 3.16. There are people who will, in fact, incur God's judgment. There are people like Nimrod who have rejected God and his authority. And they will suffer because of that. You know, the truth of the matter is, in today's world, I can find a lot of people who will tell me, I refuse to listen to God. If he exists, I reject him. And I will refuse to acknowledge his existence. One of the, my favorite jokes is about a son of an atheist who said he came home and learned about God the Father and Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he says, son, there is only one God. There is no three. And by the way, we don't believe in any of him. Well, you know, the funny part about that is, is to say that you don't believe in something is to acknowledge that it exists. And Philippians is very clear. And it's something that for those who reject God need to hear this verse because you know what? Philippians tells me that one day you will not only acknowledge God, you will bow down before him and you will confess him Lord. Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11 Therefore God has, made exalted, has highly exalted him and bestowed him with a name above every name. So at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My friends, on that day, Nimrod, Satan, and every atheist who has ever lived will in fact bow down and declare Jesus Christ their Lord. Whether they like it or not, 
whether they wish to accept him at that point or not, they will in fact declare him Lord because God is God. And you can deny God, but I'm here to tell you that you have just as much ability to go out into the stars at night and say, I want that star to move over to there. Your authority over that star is the same authority you have over God. You can wish all you want. You can think all you want. You are still powerless. And I'm here to tell you that many on that day that Philippians describes will bow before God, declare him Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and the Son of God, only then to turn and go into hell because they've rejected him. For you and me, I think it is important to understand that we examine our lives and we look to see if we are building towers to challenge God's authority in our lives. When I desire my will over God's, when I second guess his word and try and twist it to what my thinking is rather than what the Bible says, then I am truly making towers against God. Now I'll be honest with you, Unlike the Tower of Babel, my towers probably resemble more Play-Doh than they do brick. But they are just as destructive because they are a sign that I am rejecting God. That I am challenging God's authority. Nimrod set out to not only challenge God, but he was going to confront God personally. Now he gets to meet God and he will face God, but I'm here to tell you that the confrontation he thought was going to happen will be rather more like, my Lord, my God, I rejected you, and now I'm gone. For us, I will tell you that the world around you will tell you again and again that God is dead, or that he has no effect in your lives. That was Nimrod's line. I will make a tower. I will argue with God. I will confront God. And if God desires to do this, I will defeat God. Because I can make a tower so big I can charge against him. Nimrod's tower never got completed. He was the beginning of a scattering of people. Today, his name means fool, and it is never going to probably be used in anybody. I, I pity, you know, they, John, uh, Johnny Cash had a song, Boy Named Sue. I think the only thing worse than a boy named Sue would be a boy named Nimrod. Uh, you're not going to see this name upheld because the foolishness of his nature speaks throughout time. But unfortunately, the lesson that the people learned through Nimrod's time is being forgotten today. It is being overlooked and we are embracing the attitudes of Nimrod again. Nimrod should be a warning to you and me that to build our own towers, to defy God, to challenge God, to question God is a definitely dangerous place to be. When we as mere men think we are capable of judging God, we are on fact on the road of Nimrod. My friends, don't be a Nimrod. Thank you.